iconic images of the helicopter taking off from the roof of the embassy apartments, right? This is what we think of, this iconic film. We think of this as the end of America's war in Vietnam, right? In fact, that incident, those iconic images, uh, this all happened two years almost to the day after the American part of the war in Vietnam technically ended. The United States pulled its American troops and ended U.S. military operations in Vietnam in the spring of 1973. And then this all happened two years later. This was April 1975. When this happened, U.S. troops had already been gone out of Vietnam for two years. But that war in Vietnam, of course, it was not our war. That war was happening there before we got there, and that war was still happening there when we left. About a year and a half after the U.S. military ended its commitment in Vietnam in 1973, the communist forces in North Vietnam decided that they were going to launch a big new offensive that they thought would allow them to conquer the South once and for all and take over the whole country within two years. In the end, it didn't take them two years. It only took them about four months. The North Vietnamese, the communists, they won. And this picture, this iconic photo showing the evacuation of the last American personnel left in the country, as well as whatever Vietnamese employees and allies could squeeze onto the proverbial off-ramp with the last Americans at that point, this iconic American image shows two years after the American military left Vietnam, the desperate efforts to get the very last remnants of American personnel out of South Vietnam and its capital as they were captured by the North. This was April 30th, 1975. Toward the end of America's war in Vietnam, the United States was going through some of our own upheaval at home. Uh, president Nixon, of course, resigned in disgrace in 1974. That made Gerald Ford into the President of the United States, even though no group larger than his congressional district back home in Michigan had ever elected him to anything. In April 1975, two years after the U.S. had pulled out our troops from Vietnam, when it was becoming clear that South Vietnam was about to lose the war, they were about to be conquered by the communists in the North. President Ford, in April 1975, he went to Congress and he asked Congress for a big new round of aid to try to prop up South Vietnam in the face of all this obvious evidence that they were about to lose the war and Vietnam was about to become a single communist country. And, and yes, it was clear that South Vietnam was about to lose the war. And yet we did still have a few thousand U.S. personnel of various kinds based at the embassy there. But when Congress, in 1975, when they looked at the size of President Ford's aid request, I mean, he was asking for three quarters of a billion dollars for South Vietnam. Congress looked at that request and balked. They said no. In no 70 way. dollars. The Senate Foreign Huge Relations figure. Committee, at the time, they actually physically got up and walked over to the White House and sat down in the cabinet room at the White House and demanded to speak with President, President Ford about this aid request and why they were saying no. They said they basically were not going to restart the war in Vietnam no matter what was going on there. Senator Jacob Javits of New York told President Ford that day in this remarkable meeting in the cabinet room at the White House, which the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Armed Services Committee, invited themselves to. Jacob Javits told President Ford, I will give you large sums for evacuation, but not one nickel for military aid for South Vietnam. Senator John Glenn was in the room too, famous astronaut and pilot, right? He told President Ford to his face, this is an amazing quote. The idea here is very different from what I envisioned, he said. I and most senators thought of a surgical extraction, not of a 10-day or two-week operation with a bridgehead. Senator Glenn said, this is a re-entry of a magnitude we have not envisioned. I can see North Vietnam deciding not to let us get these people out and attacking our bridgehead. Then we'd have to send forces to protect our security forces. That, he said, fills me with fear. John Glenn, famous astronaut, famous test pilot, says, that fills me with fear. Congress was willing to fund an evacuation. Congress was willing to fund getting every last American out entirely, every last one out of Vietnam, even if it meant plucking them off the roof of the embassy by helicopter. But Congress was not willing to provide one nickel for further military help for the government and for the South Vietnamese military, which more than 50,000 Americans had already died trying to prop up.
President Ford wanted back in to Vietnam to stop that from happening, and the Congress said no way. They said it in dramatic fashion to his face in the White House when they were not invited. I should note that one of the senators who was in the room that day when that super dramatic fight was happening, when that Senate committee got up from their seats on Capitol Hill and marched to the White House and sat down in the cabinet room to see the president, one of the senators on the Foreign Relations Committee that day having that confrontation with the president was a very young senator named Joe Biden of Delaware. When Gerald Ford wanted to restart the war in Vietnam effectively, that resolution was very fresh in Congress's minds. And Congress had no qualms whatsoever about telling him no when he said he wanted back in to Vietnam. And so that is how that iconic footage, those iconic images came to be. Because over President Ford's objections, we did just evacuate as Saigon fell. Those pictures were taken on April 30th, 1975, and that is the day, the day, that Saigon fell. The communists from the north renamed Saigon Ho Chi Minh City. Two weeks later, the communists held a victory parade through Saigon. And to this day, Vietnam is a communist country. And yes, that is how we left it. Since then, Vietnam went through a series of market-based economic reforms. In the late 1980s, they, they opened up a stock market in the year 2000. That's the year that President Bill Clinton visited Vietnam in November 2000, November that year. For the past decade, Vietnam has had one of the highest economic growth rates in the world. In 2007, Vietnam joined the World Trade Organization. Right now, Vietnam's big fight in the world is a standoff they're having over fishing rights and maybe oil rights or mineral rights uh, with China in the South China Sea. Today, because he is required to under the War Powers Resolution of 1973, President Obama sent this declaration to Congress making his formal, legally required accounting of where U.S. military forces are deployed around the world and for what. U.S. forces, according to the President's letter that he sent to Congress today, uh, are in Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen and uh, Cuba at Guantanamo Bay, in Niger, in Chad, uh, in Uganda, in other unspecified places in Central Africa, Egypt, Jordan, Kosovo, Libya. Uh, there's no mention in the President's declaration today about U.S. forces being in Pakistan. That maybe depends on what you define as forces. For all the American political debate about the U.S. using drones to kill people in Pakistan, there's actually been no drone strikes, at least as far as anybody knows, uh, in Pakistan since Christmas. Before last night, it had been six months since there had been a U.S. drone strike in Pakistan, but apparently there was one last night and another early today. Reports are still fuzzy because they always are, because these things are secret, but it seems that there were 11 suspected militants in Pakistan killed in the first drone strike last night, and another eight people were killed in the second drone strike early this morning. These drone strikes, again, the first in six months in Pakistan, they come just three days after the Pakistani Taliban launched an attack on the biggest airport in Pakistan. They attacked the airport, the huge airport in the huge city of Karachi. The attack left 36 people dead, including 10 very well-armed attackers. The United States had reportedly stopped all its drone strikes in Pakistan last year at the request of the Pakistani government because they wanted to stop them as a sign of goodwill as they entered into peace talks with the Taliban. After this attack on the civilian airport three days ago, though, there were notably no complaints from the Pakistani military about the U.S. apparently starting its drone strikes up again last night. So the president's letter today makes no mention of Pakistan, even though we did apparently fire something like 14 missiles into Pakistan just over the last 24 hours. President Obama, in his letter, he does note uh, that a classified annex to this report to Congress provides some additional information, so maybe that's where they talk about Pakistan, but of course, we never get to see that stuff. Also not mentioned in the president's declaration of all the myriad places we've got U.S. forces deployed right now is the nation of Iraq. And maybe we do have some super secret classified force there that we're not allowed to know about, like we do in lots of other countries around the world. But the fact is that conventional declared U.S. forces are not there anymore at all, other than a small embassy protection contingent of about 200 troops. As the news from Iraq in the last few days has gone from terrible to legitimately frightening, there isn't a U.S. presence there. Nobody knows if the next fall of Saigon is going to be the fall of Baghdad. 
pictures today of these young men and teenagers in Baghdad. These are young men and teenagers in Baghdad voluntarily signing up to join the Iraqi army. They did open air army recruitment events in Baghdad today. They're signing up to fight to try to save their city as militant groups approach Baghdad.